The question I asked myself at the onset of this project sounds pretty simple. Can I design a 3D printable RC aircraft that is designed in one size, but with the ability to scale it up or down a certain percentage in order to print the same design in multiple sizes? Stay tuned to learn more about the hurdles I faced during this project and what I ultimately came up with. Thanks for watching and welcome to 3D Aero Ventures. Before we get to today's video, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, SolidWorks, and a really exciting new product they're offering. This year, SolidWorks announced they're making their design software available to makers and hobbyists for personal projects for only $99 per year. At that price, 3D Experience SolidWorks for Makers includes the latest version of SolidWorks Professional, which is the locally installed software that I use for all of my designs, as well as their web-based software, 3D Creator and 3D Sculptor. What's even better is, for my viewers, SolidWorks is providing a limited time 20% discount offer. Check out the link in the description below to sign up and start using one of the best computer-aided design tools on the planet. Thank you to SolidWorks for your sponsorship, and now, back to the video. While the concept of a scalable design sounds simple at first, it presents a whole slew of problems when it comes to making sure all the different size electronics and hardware will fit perfectly at the different sizes. I could design the aircraft in SolidWorks in one size, but I had to give the design a ton of forethought to make sure different size bolts, carbon fiber tubes, and other hardware would have the same fit relationship with the 3D printed parts as I scale the parts up or down. Being a product of the 90s, I decided on a popular design called the Stinger, produced by the now defunct Lanier RC company. Given the complexity of making sure the design is seamlessly scalable, I wanted to at least start with a relatively simple aircraft and I wanted it to be a capable aerobat. With its straight, fully symmetrical wing and somewhat boxy fuselage, the Stinger ticked all the boxes. Plus, Lanier RC actually produced this kit in several different sizes, so it's a natural fit for a scalable 3D printed version. I started by designing around some downloadable plans of the Stinger, but being the nerd that I am, I decided to make some aerodynamic improvements to the original design. The ailerons on the original Stinger were just made from flat balsa, rather than following the shape of the airfoil of the wing. I made that change and I also split the full length ailerons in half to give my version of the Stinger some flaps for better slow flight capability. This, combined with the printed in place vortex generators, should give the Stinger really nice slow speed handling. You may have seen these little fins called vortex generators on full scale aircraft before. They're a useful design element if you want to lower the stall speed of an aircraft. The way they function has to do with what is called the boundary layer, which is a layer of air right above the surface of the aircraft's wing, where friction from the skin of the aircraft slows the airflow down and removes some of its energy. As the airflow slows down moving along the back of the wing, it loses energy, and especially at high angles of attack, it separates from the wing, causing the wing to stall. The high energy air above the boundary layer isn't affected by the skin of the airplane, so the vortex generators act like tiny wingtips, pulling in some of that higher energy air above the boundary layer by introducing higher energy spiraling vortices into the boundary layer and allowing the airflow to maintain its energy longer as it flows over the back of the wing. This doesn't fully prevent an airplane from stalling, but the wing can now operate at a slower speed and higher angle of attack before airflow separation causes the wing to stall. I also made some structural improvements to this design versus some of my previous designs. My main structural concern was with the rigidity and durability of 3D printed landing gear, especially with the largest version of this design. So I designed the landing gear struts to house a carbon fiber tube that runs the length of the strut into the side of the fuselage and fuses with the rigid plastic tray that runs through the center of the fuselage. I also had a concern about the strength of 3D printed control horns. Rather than having the control horns print in place, I left a hole through each control surface and will be using a bolt held in place with a lock nut to act as the control horn. As far as scaling this design up or down, I determined it was best to work in thirds. In other words, if the base design is at a scale of 100%, 
Then I could scale the design down a third to about 67% scale or up a third to about 133% scale. But my main concern as I scale the design up or down is the fit relationship of the various hardware sizes with the 3D printed parts. When designing something you want to slide together, like a carbon fiber wing tube into a hole, you actually need to design a small gap between the mating parts to leave room for variation in the manufacturing process, in this case 3D printing, and to make sure the parts slide freely. For example, I typically design the holes that receive carbon fiber wing tubes to have a diameter that is 0.4 millimeters larger than the carbon fiber tube itself. Because I'm scaling the design up or down by thirds, I had to make sure the diameter of most of the hardware in the base design is divisible by three. For example, for the base design, I plan on using 12 millimeter diameter carbon fiber wing tubes, and most of the bolts will be three millimeter diameter. So scaling up the design 133% will result in a 16 millimeter diameter wing tube and four millimeter diameter bolts. But I want to determine the scaling percentages based on the holes that receive the hardware to make sure I maintain the fit relationship across the different sizes. So scaling up the 12.4 millimeter diameter hole for the wing tubes to a 16.4 millimeter diameter hole results in a scaling percentage of 132.2%, not 133%. And scaling down the 12.4 millimeter diameter hole to 8.4 millimeter diameter results in a scaling percentage of 67.7%, not 66%. So that is what I settled on. The base design has a 60 and a half inch wingspan, and when scaled down to 67.7% scale, it has a 41 inch wingspan. When scaled up to 132.2% scale, it has an 80 inch wingspan, which is a really large model for a 3D printed RC aircraft. With the CAD work done, I set out to print all of the parts, with the bulk of the parts printed in ColorFab LWPLA and strategic parts printed in a more rigid material like standard PLA or PETG. It was a ton of parts. The downside of pursuing this scalable design is the number of parts required to make it happen. In order to make sure the parts for the largest 80 inch wingspan version of the Stinger fit on the typical 3D printer bed, I had to split the design into smaller components than I normally would for a 60 inch or 40 inch wingspan aircraft. The assembly of the 3D printed components is pretty straightforward and similar to my past videos, so check those out if you want to see how the parts are designed to fit together. The only difference with this design is how the wing halves bolt onto the fuselage. I designed two small tabs in each wing to slide into the interior of the fuselage and bolt into heat set threaded inserts that are sunk into the rigid plastic tray that runs through the interior of the fuselage. Combined with the carbon fiber tubes that run from wingtip to wingtip, this makes for a super strong wing connection. I initially planned to start my test flight adventures with the base 60 inch wingspan version alone, but I couldn't help myself and I printed out the 80 inch version as well. Both proved to be too tail heavy on initial flights. They were extremely sensitive on the controls, particularly with the elevator or pitch control. I managed to save the 60 inch version and played with adding more nose weight to dial in the flight performance. But the 80 inch version didn't survive the first flight as the fuselage area around the landing gear crumbled on the first landing due to its added weight. But I was glad to see that the landing gear itself with the carbon fiber tube design running throughout was extremely strong. After several more test flights on the base 60 inch model, I realized the same fuselage area around the landing gear wasn't going to hold up long term. Plus, the need for extra nose weight made my decision to reprint the fuselage pretty easy, replacing the front two fuselage components with a more rigid, albeit heavier, standard PLA. The reworked fuselages proved to be successful and I'm happy to say the Stinger flies great. And I'd like to give a big thank you to my buddy James, for helping me out with the chase footage on these flights. If you want to see a bunch of chase flight footage, check out his channel linked in the video description below. And to my lovely wife, thanks for your steady hand on the handheld camera. She doesn't have a YouTube channel, but if you want to give her some words of encouragement, just comment below and I'll pass it along.
As I was saying, no matter what scale it's built to, the Stinger flies well. The 40-inch wingspan model needed quite a bit of nose weight, which made it a bit heavy for its size, but still flies well. The 60 inch wingspan version is a great manageable size with excellent flying characteristics for a first sport aerobatic model. But my favorite size is the large 80 inch version. Not only is it an impressive size for a 3D printed RC aircraft, but it has the lightest wing loading of the three sizes, with excellent slow flight characteristics. The fact that it is my favorite of the three made this mishap particularly painful. I don't want to throw the manufacturer of the radio receiver I installed in the aircraft under the bus, so I'll just say this. I recommend not skimping on the electronics and buy a well-known, reliable receiver brand, even if it's more expensive. It's truly a case of you get what you pay for. Despite the hurdles I faced throughout this project, I learned a valuable lesson. Personally, it's very easy for me to get overwhelmed at the onset of a large project like this one. My brain just runs in circles thinking about how much needs to get done and how much could potentially go wrong, so I hesitate to get started. But I eventually get in a time crunch and I'm forced to take that first step to get the project off the ground. No pun intended. But I've found that every single time, with every seemingly daunting project, once I take that first step, the second step becomes a little easier, and then the next step even easier, and so on, until I eventually look back and think, Look how far I've come. I can't stop now. And that gives me that boost of energy I need to get through the finish line. With every important project, don't overthink it. Quiet your brain and just start. Thanks for watching, and as always, remember to never stop exploring, never stop questioning, and never stop playing. I sometimes wonder why. I cannot see your eyes If not by memory Perhaps a cry it's For your love I desire Like a bird Rain